Hello, welcome to Stevens Academy's video on demand lessons. I'm Isaac Choi, I'm the physics teacher at Stevens Academy. For the past few months, we've been, we have been preparing the VOD lessons for AP Physics B, and then uh, it covers the entire curriculum. Whatever you need to know is in the VOD. Now, for the VOD lessons, we, be, we will be using the Princeton Review AP Physics B preparation book. Now, I have chosen this book because it has the best contents in terms of uh, the uh, theoretical background and also in terms of multiple choice questions. Now for the FIQ, many of you should already know the fact that College Board offers the entire uh, FIQ questions, the past exams, right? But then multiple choice questions, you can't find it so easily. Now in terms of multiple choice questions, the uh, Princeton Review offers the ones that has the most similar difficulty uh, compared to the actual AP exam. That's why we choose this book. Now if you have a different edition, the one that we're using here is 2014. But even if you have a different edition, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, it co contains exactly the same content in terms of the theoretical background and also in terms of problems, they probably have almost exactly the same thing. Now, um, the lessons consist of 39 theoretical background covering entire AP Physics B and then we also have 13 or 14 videos of uh, problem solving sections. And then during the problem solving section, we'll be going over the multiple choice questions from the book and then we will also cover three full set of uh, free response questions uh, from the collegeboard.com. Now you can download those uh, problems from collegeboard.com uh, if you have just you know sign up the ID, so you don't have to worry about that either. Uh, if you have uh, any questions regarding the contents of the um, video lessons, you can always uh, post it online in this uh, web uh, website for Stevens Academy, and then we will answer it as soon as possible. Um, plus, uh, I hope that you all get five on this, like good luck with the preparation. And uh, in terms of the VOD, it contains all the knowledges that you are uh, seeking, the necessary knowledges in order for you to get five. So if you buy this VOD and then uh, if, even if you don't understand it the first time, just watch it twice or three times and I'm sure that you will all get five. Uh, thank you very much and I'm Isaac Choi. Hello, my name is Isaac. Um, I'm here to teach you physics, AP Physics B. Now the lessons are gonna be based on the what is it assumption that you know a little bit of physics, but uh, I will go through all of the basics. So even if you're not really confident with physics, it's okay. Um, I'm gonna walk you through it. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is a vector. Everything in physics divides into two different type of quantities, vector and scalar. Vector is simply uh, any quantity that has a direction and scalar is uh, any quantity that doesn't have a direction. For instance, if you're taking a long pathway to get to your home from this point A, that point B, if you're talking about the distance in terms of scalar, the length of the line will be your distance. Okay? So the every bit of length of this curvy line will be your distance and that's a scalar. But if you're talking about vector, you simply pick the initial point and the final point and you make a straight line between two points. Now the straight line uh, represents a vector. In terms of vector, distance is called displacement. Now this is the most simple thing about the physics but surprisingly, a lot of people doesn't notice the difference between distance and displacement. Uh, it's a totally different thing, as you can see. So, for instance, if you start from point A, you circled around, and you ended up at the same point. All right? In such a situation, the length of the curvy line will be your distance. So uh, apparently it's non-zero, right? But then your displacement, since you start at the same point, and end up at the same point, it's a zero, okay? Now what we're gonna talk about is how to deal with the vectors as you will have to as you go through the AP Physics B. Um, vector could be anything, it could be force, it could be distance, it could be uh, velocity, acceleration, you name it. Now, whenever you see a vector, it's, it's important that you know how to 
separate them into vertical portion and horizontal portion of the vector. Now let's say this vector is uh, v1. Then your horizontal component of the vector, we call, we will call it in this lesson vx. Um, you can get it by v1 cosine theta. Okay. If you know a little bit of trigonometry, as you can see, if you use the theta as the reference angle, the bottom line which is same as the vx, is your adjacent. And then the length of the vector usually represents the magnitude of the vector. Now, magnitude is the portion of the vector that represents the quantity, OK? So notice there we can assume that vector has two quantities, magnitude and direction, OK? Magnitude can be many things. It could be certain distance, 10 meters, or velocity, or a force. Okay? Direction, usually, you use the degree system or radians. Um, all right? So whenever they say the theta equals to 60 degree, you're going to have to assume that it starts from the positive x-axis in the four quadrant system, okay? So you know that the vector will have a direction towards the, the, um, the point between first and the second. No, 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 the point in the first quadrant, I'm sorry. All right, similarly, the Vy component of the vector will be v1 sine theta, OK? And then you can make the equality. v1 now can be represented by vy plus vx. Now, that's basically how you divide the vector into two vertical and horizontal components. All right? Simple enough so far. Um, now, how to add vectors? Let's say we're trying to add these two vectors, one going in positive um, first quadrant direction and then the other one going into negative y positive x direction. Uh, uh, geometrically, the simple uh, way to add vectors uh, is as followed. You simply draw the first vector and then from the ending point of the first vector, you draw the second one. Okay? And then the very initial point and very final point, if you connect those two points, that would be your final vector v. Calling this v1, v2, we know that v equals to v1 plus v2. Now, geometrically, it doesn't look too hard. You can add many other vectors. Like, I could simply add six different vectors, and then I know that my vector will look like this. Now, this type of question also comes up in AP Physics B. Surprisingly, many people get it wrong. Um, but the geometric method is al not always allowed. You, you, uh, you should know, you have to know how to do it um, numerically as well. So that's what we're going to talk about now. All right, let's say you have two vectors in terms of velocity. Velocity 1 has magnitude of 60 meters per second. And then let's say the um, Reference angle is 45 degrees. <laughs> and velocity 2 has 30 meter per second of magnitude. And your actual angle, let that be 120, and your reference angle 60. OK? Now, you always start dealing with the vectors first by dividing them up uh, to, into vertical and horizontal components. OK? For the vector 1, the horizontal component will be magnitude multiplied by cosine of 45 degrees. So that would be this guy. Now, sine component will also be 
Magnitude multiplied by sine of 45. Remember, y is always sine, x is always cosine. This guy. All right, let's go to vector 2. Now, vector 2 is a different case because you have reference angle of 60, but then as you notice, the direction is different, right? Uh, you have to use your actual angle in order to find out v1, v2x, and v2y, 30 meter per second. Now, since this is the horizontal component, again, you use cosine 120. And then here you use sine 120. Therefore, the cosine value will be a negative value negative 15 meter per second and here will you get that and that all right once you divide the vector up to x and y component now we can make it into a component form all right so in magnitude and angle form vector 2 will be 30 meter per second at 120 degrees okay writing it in form of the component vector you can either use the the system and simply note the x and y values like that or you can also say that negative 15 i plus 15 square root of 3 j now the i and j doesn't uh, represent the imaginary numbers all right it only represents the directional components so i and j actually tells you the direction i means that it's going into positive x direction j means that it's going to positive y direction. Now there's an another component z which is for the um, so another dimension what I mean is that you have x, y and then you have z. This is often used when you are talking about a 3D graph. Now the k is the component for the z part. Okay. Now getting back to adding these two vectors, now I don't need the top parts since I have all the information I need here. Simply you add the x components together and then y components together in order to create your final vector. So vx1 plus v2x will be your final vx. Uh, that portion will be so that's approximately Twenty-seven, and then vy component will be simply adding these two factors, and that would be twenty-five point five. I'm not sure if I'm right. I'm just um, approximating it. Uh, then it becomes sixty-seven point five meter per second. All right, so these two are your finer Vx and Vy components, adding these two vectors. Now, one last thing that you must know is how to convert that back to magnitude and direction form. Now, the magnitude will be Vx squared plus Vy squared under square root. That comes from the Pythagorean theorem, as you can see, uh, Vx, Vy. If we add them together uh, in the same way that we talked about before geometrically, then your final vector becomes this, right? And simply, you can get the magnitude using your Pythagorean theorem. Um, now, finding the, the angle, reference angle, depends on the tangent value. You use anti-tangent, uh, um, negative one tangent. Inverse tangent. Inverse tangent for Vx and Vy. Vy over Vx will be your reference angle. Now, one thing to watch out for is that tangent value is not sensitive to direction always. Um, not always sensitive to direction. What I mean is that, as you, can, as you already know, probably, the first quadrant and third quadrant offers positive value for tangent. Right? So once you plug in positive value for Vy and Vx into inverse tangent, it's always going to give you the angle in the first quadrant. Okay? So the better way of doing this 
is making sure that you plug in a um, absolute value for the ratio between Vy and Vx into the inverse tangent. That way you always get a reference angle. Once you get the reference angle, by looking at the signs of Vx and Vy, figure out which quadrant the vector lies in, and then you can find out the final angle. This is, uh, surprisingly, this is very important because a lot of people get problems wrong because of this simple factor. Okay. Vector addition is about the only thing that you need to know about the vectors as far as the physics B goes. Um, so we're going to move on to the kinematics. Physics is basically a study of motion. It studies everything that moves, everything that reacts to anything. Uh, now kinematics talks about that motion. It's concentrated on the motion itself. So the three basic properties that you need to know about the kinematics will be displacement, um, velocity, and acceleration. And all these three are vectors. All right. From now on, what you have to always keep in mind is when you learn a new subject, when you learn about the new variable, always make sure whether you know, uh, you know that whether it is a vector or a scalar. Okay. In terms of scalar displacement, again, as I talked about, is a distance, and then velocity in terms of scalar is a speed. Acceleration is always a vector. Okay, so displacement gets changed by the velocity. So definition of the velocity will be rate of change for displacement. How fast your displacement is changing based on time. Now acceleration and velocity has the same exact relationship. Acceleration is the rate of change for velocity. So for instance, if you have 10 meter per second of velocity, what does that mean? It means that your, uh, your displacement is increasing. 10 meters per second. So after five seconds, you have gone. You, sh you should have gone uh, 50 meters. Now acceleration, if it's two meter per second square, it talks about the change in velocity, not displacement directly. Okay? It means that your velocity will increase two meter per second per second. All right? So this is actually this. You know what I'm saying? So in one second, your velocity will increase two, uh, by portion of two meter per second. Um, yeah, summing it up, it becomes like that. You may or may not know the three big equations about the kinematics. Displacement equals to V initial T plus one half A T squared. And then velocity finer equals to velocity initial plus acceleration times time. And then Velocity finer square equals to vi square plus 2a delta displacement. Now, um, what you have to keep in mind is that t, whenever it appears, uh, it's mostly delta t, meaning that it's talking about the time elapsement between point A and point B. It's not talking about the time of exact day or something like that. Um, now these all three equations comes from the same basis. We're going to look at it through a graph. Now let's say this is a velocity times time graph. Okay, as you can see, you have an angle. Uh, whenever you have a graph of certain quantity, the slope is always the rate of change for the quantity. Okay. Here you're talking about the velocity. So rate of change for velocity is an acceleration. Therefore, the slope represents acceleration. And as you can see, the slope is linear. So here we have a constant accelerated motion. And area under it represents the quantity that it's changing, the, the y component. If the y component represents a certain type of rate of change, then the area under it will be that quantity. Okay? So here you have velocity versus time. Velocity is the rate of change for the displacement. Therefore, the area under it is the displacement. All right. 
Now let's put things in terms of the uh, variables that we put up here. The starting velocity here, that's vi. And the final velocity here, which is the height of the triangle, is the v final. Okay? Since the area under it, under it is the you know area of the triangle, we can get simply get it by. Um, all right, let's let's change the graph a little bit so I can show it better. Let's say it didn't start at zero, but it started at some point here. So you have a height for vi too. Um, then your area is base one plus base two times the height divided by two, right? So vi plus v finer times the delta t divided by two. Uh, you can also figure out the equation for refiner, which is the y component. You know, this is just the linear function. So refiner would be v initial plus a t. A being the slope right here, and then t being the component for the x. Now, if you plug that in to here, because this free finer and that free finer are the same quantity, you get area equals 2 v initial plus 2, 2 v initial plus v finer. No, no, v finer has been um, replaced. So a t times t divided by 2, which then becomes v i t plus 1 half a t squared. Doesn't it look exactly like that? So we can refer, uh, again, now you know that this equation actually comes from uh, developing things around this graph, okay? And same with this equation, we finally equals to vi plus at. Now these two are the most basic and most important equation. Everything else just comes from here. Let's, let's see how you can develop the third equation out of these two. Um, so, if I use this and square both sides, like this, then you would get something like this, right? Now, Factoring out 2a here, you get this. Now, this portion is exactly the same as that, so I can replace it with the displacement. Then I get, finally, v final square equals to v initial square plus 2a delta d, which is the third equation I wrote there. Okay? Now, just one more thing, and we'll do this graph. If you look at this equation, this particular equation, which, which is the one that I used to find out the initial area of this polygon. Now, um, it's interesting how this looks simpler than this equation to many people. That's because this is actually an equation that you can use in order to find out the uh, displacement in many of the problems. Now, whenever you have a constant accelerated motion, you can always use this equation, okay? And another fact is that the portion of the equation right here, v initial plus v finer divided by 2, that represents the average velocity for a constant accelerated motion. All right? So if your acceleration is changing, you can't use this. It only depends on the case where your acceleration is constant. Okay. All right, moving on, let's look at a couple of questions for kinematics. All right, let's say the car is moving at 20 meters per second to a certain direction, and it's accelerated by 3 meters per second square. And then, let's say it travels 400 meters. And the question asks you how long it takes for the car to get to that point. 
then you can just use the first equation, which is displacement equals to bit plus one half at squared. Um, substituting the values, 400 meter is your displacement, so 400 meter equals to vi is your 20 meter per second times time plus one half three meter per second squared and then t squared. Now unit is important, meter, meter square, meter per second square, unit is important, but when you got your unit to uh, variable down to one and everything else is filled up with a number, you can just assume that the numbers are just numbers, okay? Then it becomes a quadratic formula. You can uh, simply find out the t by using the quadratic formula in this case. Let's look at another one. Uh, cars going 40 meters per second. Since acceleration is not always a positive number, let's say it's slowing down. It's slowing down with uh, negative 5 meters per second square of deceleration. And you're yeah, so the question asks you, how long would it take until the car comes to a complete stop? And then how much distance would you need to have in order for the car, car to not to crash into, crash into something? Um, okay, so here you need to use a couple of equations. First, you can use V finer equals to V initial plus AT in order to find out the time it takes for the car to stop, okay? So whenever the question said it comes to a complete stop or it starts from resting, you can assume that the velocity is zero. And that's also another important factor. When, whenever it says it starts from rest, it, said, uh, it means that your initial velocity equals to zero. And then whenever it says it needs to come to a complete stop or it has come to a complete stop, it means that your final velocity equals to zero. So zero equals to 40 meters per second plus negative 5 meter per second squared times t, t simply a second. Okay, once you have the t, you can use the, what is it, the first equation, displacement equals to vi plus a t squared, <laughs> one half. Um, since you have t, 8, vi, 40 meter per second, a, negative 5 meter per second squared, you, you have every variable on the right side, right? So if you just simply substitute it, you will get your displacement. Okay, so um, acceleration, displacement, and velocity, we have talked about the basic properties of kinematics. Now, um, the simple application of kinematics can lead you to be able to calculate questions for the free falling. Free falling is the next subject that we're going to talk about. Free falling means that you're dropping from the sky and then nothing is stopping you. Usually, um, if you drop from the sky, there is a terminal velocity since the air resistance resists your motion. But um, in MP physics speed, those kind of questions doesn't come out. You have to ignore the air resistance. Therefore, you get the full gravitational acceleration, 9.8 meter per second square. Okay? Gravity is pulling you down and it's giving you certain acceleration called g, and that's 9.8 meter per second square. Uh, there's only two type of equation that you have to get accustomed to in terms of free falling, one for the height, the other one for the t. Um, height is also type of displacement, okay? So I can assume that this is also vit plus one half at squared. Now it doesn't have vi, hence the term free falling means that you don't, you don't have an initial velocity, okay? So ignoring this part and knowing your acceleration equals to g, the equation gets simpler. Height equals to one half gt squared, okay? Since g is a constant, you only have two variables, height and t, x and y. So if you know the time it took, you, um, it took you to fall from a certain point to um, bottom of the earth, uh, bottom of the ground, then you can find out where you dropped from, okay? The height that you dropped from.
Now, uh, fixing the equation in terms of t, you get t equal square root of 2h over g. That equation and this equation. These are the only two equations that you need to know in terms of free falling. Uh, so this equation will tell you if you know the height that you drop from, let's say it's 400 meters, then how long it would take you to reach the ground. Uh, if you use this equation, it will something like this, 800 divided by, so that's approximately 9 seconds. Hmm. So from the really tall building, 400 meters, that's almost like the tallest building in the city. Um, from the really tall building, if you drop something, it's going to take 9 seconds for it to reach the ground, which is quicker than what normally people think. Okay, so we have gone over kinematics. Uh, so in your book, the Princeton Review, that will be a little bit of chapter four and full chapter three. You know how to do the vector summation. You know what i's and j's are. You know how to add them. Um, unfortunately, I don't see any problems at the end of chapter three. So we'll go over the last a little bit of kinematics next time and solve more problem there. Okay.